Hi, uh, we are Teaching Tilt Brush, and this is Basic Brushes 2, looking at the second page of brushes that are built into Google's Tilt Brush. Basic Brushes 1 was looking at the very first panel on the brushes page of the controller. It was all about markers. This is going to be page 2, where we introduce the more interesting special effects brushes. Now we're just keeping the basics, we're not bringing in audio controls or anything like that, so we're just going to see what these tools, tools do and how they work. We're going to start with our Mr. Sunshine here, the light tool. This is also the one Tilt Brush starts you in by default in a brand new session. I'm going to use my brush size to make it bigger so we can see it a little better. Here's how it's going to work. Light is indeed drawing in light. Now you'll notice it is not a perfect line. It is sort of like a brush stroke. So a quick short stroke just gives you edges. But if you draw it out, you can really see the texture that goes into these brushes. Some of them are going to be faded like this. Some of them are going to be pure color. They all have their differences. What's nice with light is you can keep scrubbing it in if you really want a nice, bright, saturated glow. It is affected by color. So if I bring up that, that pale value, it is a white as opposed to a very dark blue light. So your color palette does affect the appearance of the light itself. Brush size, again, we're going to go for a tiny point of light versus a much broader stroke of light. Likewise, changing your scale. I'm going to go to dinosaur size, get a large brush. So when I go back to normal size, I've got a large glowing blue shape done with a light brush. That was the light brush, number one of our second set of brushes. The one next to it, fire, exactly like you would expect. You'll notice it's a much larger brush because it's got more detail. Not only does it have more detail in the shape of the fire, but if you watch, it's animated as well. Let me get a brighter orangey fire, brighter orangey fire. It is the same shape each time you draw, but as you draw it out, you see how it stretches the fire tool. Likewise, you can change the angle of rotation that you're painting it to change the appearance of the fire a little bit as well. We're getting a little overwhelmed with the fire. So it's also affected by the lighter and darkerness. So here's a nice dark fire as opposed to a very bright fire. So you can get a lot of variation with the color and the light and darkness of your palette. So fire tool is a great deal of fun. I often will use it, uh, large strips of it, to simulate rivers of lava and things like that because there's a lot of motion within the brush itself. Fire tool, lots of fun to play with. Embers plays nicely with it because as you can see from my brush, it adds sparks. Wherever you paint, sparks come from that point. So if I paint a lot in one place, it creates a bonfire of embers. They actually go up fairly far, but I could actually paint up to extend their range even further. Or if I paint across, you can see it leaves a trail of sparks behind you. So they're a lot of fun. Uh, they are totally affected by all of your color variations as well. So you can have your purple or your blue. Likewise, they do have size. So you'll notice if I move the sparks up close into the camera, you can see that they are of a specific sort of round square pixel shape. But the different sizes will give you different sizes of the pixels. So if I go to dinosaur size with the largest ember I can get, you can see those embers are actually physically larger than the original embers. A lot of fun to play with. You can get a lot of cool effects. They also only go up. So if you want your embers to go sideways or anything, no dice. That's just embers. That's the way they, they roll. Smoke is also another animated brush. And again, the larger and smaller sizes makes a difference. So here is purple smoke, dark purple smoke. So even when the color is almost black, it's still an obvious glowy kind of smoke. The more you paint in, the more vibrant it becomes. If I boost that color up to a pale purple, you can see it does change the color. It also washes out much more quickly. I can go for a very small brush to leave little trails in the air. Or I could go up to dinosaur size, get a very large brush, and actually make these massive fog banks and things. So on normal size, I'm getting lost in the fog. 
The smoke brush, I also like to use it to simulate foam, that type of thing. There is a slight motion to it. So when I just do it as a horizontal line, you can see there is a wobble to that line, a slight, slow ripple. That's inherent in the smoke tool itself. So if you want the smoke to be totally static, it's not going to be. That is the smoke tool on our page two of brushes. Snow does exactly as advertised. And again, your brush size can make a difference. So if I go to the small brush size where you paint, it will be gently cascading snow right there until whenever. I'm going to switch to a different color and go for a larger brush and then paint over here. So a larger brush gives us larger actual snowflakes. These little ones are still the same snowflakes, just at a much smaller size. So it's more of a light, puffy, realistic snow, whereas this is almost your inside the snow globe, glittery, artificial type of snow. They both are wonderful effects, depending on the type of painting you're trying to do, but snow will always be gently flowing down. The size also is going to be limited. So as I go up to larger scale, you can see the larger size still brushed in an area. So if I wanted more, I would have to brush an entire area like that. And now, no matter where I go, I'm going to be surrounded by this gently falling snow. Snow brush. Lots of fun. Uh, again, good for environmental type of thing. Rainbow is actually the whole rainbow. And you see it follows a pulsing pattern. Even if I choose different colors of my brush tool, it's still the same rainbow. Rainbow is one of the tools that's not directly affected by the color palette. This is also a tool we'll be coming back to because this is one you can see is animated. We can have this one synchronized to music. Later on, we'll be looking at audio brushes. And this is the type of thing we can make a discotheque that's actually beating to whatever music we have playing. So we can be painting to music while the painting dances to that music. We'll get there, we'll get there. But that's the whole point of this brush. Not only does it make nice rainbows, but we'll be coming back to these guys for some more interesting special effects as well. Brush size is indeed the size of the rainbow versus tiny, but it's always going to be the same set every single time. So even if you go in the other direction, it's still going to be the same repeating pattern for the whole thing. Rainbow brush. Stars are similar to snow. The biggest difference being they don't fall. They don't go anywhere. I just paint them and they sparkle. Again, we can go to different sizes, which will give us different sizes of star, just so we can see the shape and the detail more clearly. This is another fun one to do very far in the distance to give you this sort of glittering haze in the background or to use as little embellishment points to have where things happen. There's this little sparkle of, of, of lights where they happen. So the stars tool, again, if we choose different colors, it'll affect different colors. The light and dark is more of the brightness value. So here's a case where we have the dark shade of blue versus the bright pale shade of blue. It is more of a bluish tint here. These guys have more of a glow to them. So the term for computer users is bloom, and it adds more of that bloom effect to the brighter color of star. Just useful for enhancements. Star tool. Velvet ink. This one is actually very similar to the brushes we looked at in Brushes 1. It's not animated, it paints like a paintbrush, and it's got a nice texture, very similar to the textures we saw in the magic markers and things like that. If I paint a nice big swoop and get in nice and close, you can see how the line itself has a very distinct brush stroke. Velvet brush, so the paint itself is very smooth, but we've got these textures going with it. Even on a larger size, we can see how that is just lovely, rich color. As I paint back and forth, it's got this translucency to it. So it can really build up color and build up shape. That's the velvet brush tool. Velvet brush tool on our panel here. 
Final line, waveform, similar to rainbow, this one was made specifically to work with sound. You can see it's a sine wave. If we start music playing through this, you know, if the microphone was active, that type of stuff, then we could actually have it pick up and listen for music and it would start playing to that music. What we'll be doing in later lessons is bringing in this audio tool and specifically how do you use it in conjunction with your music players. We're not gonna be doing it here because we're just looking at the basic tools. So I can paint this in any direction. You can see how that works. And when we start playing with audio tools and things, all of these lines will be a sine wave to the audio files that you're playing. But at this point, we don't wanna get into messing with files and folders just yet. We're just gonna keep the tools as the basics. Waveform, it is still fully affected by our color palette, but its motion will be played with later on with music. Splatter brush, this one seems sort of weird, but has a lot of good applications. Here's what it looks like. A splatter of paint, and it's three dimensional. So you'll notice it's got shadow and highlight. So it is affected by your light source. You can see highlights versus shadows. This is an interesting pattern because, for example, green makes very good for leaves and natural patterns like that. I use it in water or for pebbles. If I wanted a pebbled path, I might do several shades of gray overlapping in different sizes to imply different types of, of stonework, that type of stuff. So the splatter brush, especially because we can uh, change the size of the brush tip. Let's find a color people can see here. from a very small stream to a very large splatter to our dinosaur size huge splatters. You can see there's a lot of detail, a lot of shape to these. So you can do a lot of creativity, whether it's just showing hand painted things or splatter marks. Splatter brush gives you a very organic and yet still three dimensional tool to play with. That one's a lot of fun. You'll see us using that in a lot of our videos. Splatter tool. The final two tools of our basic brushes too here are the duct tape and the paper. And they are very similar in that they give you an actual flat ribbon that you're painting with. Duct tape has this glossy surface. If we get up close to it, you can see it's textured, just like duct tape is. So as I'm painting, it reacts as if I'm unrolling a, a roll of duct tape behind my brush. So these types of shapes, if I wanted to do a large sort of plane type of thing, you can see how the duct tape gives you a flat surface to work with. We'll even be looking at guides and stuff so I can actually make a flat pane and make sure I'm painting directly on that flat surface. But duct tape really gives you a nice edge, a nice feeling, a very solid feeling object like duct tape. It'll hold everything together, a light side, dark side. Yeah, you guys know the joke. So duct tape, second to last tool, very useful for getting solid textured color. Paper is also textured, but it's not glossy like the duct tape is. You know how duct tape is waterproof and it's got that glossy surface. You can see paper still has sort of a rough surface along it. It's also done as a ribbon that's dependent on the size of your mouse. But the biggest difference between it and duct tape is the quality of the surface. Not as glossy, not as reflective, doesn't have the woven texture. This is meant to be strips of paper. It does have a noticeable thickness like the duct tape as well, and different size paper will give you different lines in the world. So the paper brush, it is very close to mimicking exactly the colors. With duct tape, You'll notice because of the glossiness, even if I change the colors a bit, it doesn't actually seem to affect the duct tape very much. It stays almost a silvery shade. Whereas the paper version, it's gonna go for the pure color of the exact shade you pick on your color palette. It won't have this silver metally washed out. It'll have a much brighter, truer color. So the difference, Let's get back centered and then clear this out because I can't even see my own hands anymore. 
So the difference between our duct tape and our paper is just the quality of the surface. They both do a ribbon of various sizes. So that is the second page of brushes in Google's Tilt Brush. Just more interesting ways, rather than just the solid color and solid lines of the first brushes, this is bringing in some animation and some special effects. So if I wanted to, I could actually write in fire and it's still going to pick up everything that I'm talking about. So I'm just going to be uh, scribbling out our usual messages here. But let us know in the comments if you have any questions. We're going to be doing these uh, subs. Missing a C. There we go. So we're going to be doing questions and comments uh, between shows through you, uh, the YouTube comments and things like that. So feel free to join us every week. Let us know if there's tools you'd like to know about. And we're going to be doing this for the foreseeable future. So enjoy your tilt brushing, and we'll see you soon.